But please, Hagar Cafe, this is Tun Lokwe's first time ever on Hagar Cafe and first time ever doing an Insta Live. So could you please make yeah. her feel welcome? Send her lots of hugs and love. I'm sending you a hug, Tolu. You're going to be fantastic, I know. You don't have any issues at all whatsoever. But um, yes, yeah, so everybody is sending you love. Thank you, thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, good. So you can hear us properly. That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so... Tolu introduce yourself to us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. My name is Tolu Lokwe Um, What do I do? I work as a project manager. I'm a wife and a mom of two lovely children. Um, I run a charity organization for children, so I'm very passionate about help, helping the underprivileged. I think that's just me in a nutshell. Uh, I don't like the way you put just, because that's more than just. <laughs> So that's you, yeah, but not just. There's a okay. lot to you. <laughs> There's a lot to you. Okay, so today we're going to talk about your story because you have a story that is, um, well, it's your story, you know? And I think, like I was saying before you came on, that every story is important and every story um, has a purpose and a meaning. And of course, because we're Christians, we believe that there's a bigger purpose for all of our stories. So what I'm just going to ask you to do is just tell us about your story. Like, you know, where, well, start at the beginning. And then I'll stop okay. you so often to ask you questions and just confirm stuff and whatnot. So off you go. The floor is yours. Okay. So you said to start at the beginning. So um, I got married in 2015. Okay. And so you started at the beginning as in your marriage. Yes. Before you got married, did you plan uh -huh. to be married? Did you have dreams for the future? Oh, yeah. Did you see yourself yeah. in a particular role? Okay, yes. Yeah. So before I always wanted to get married at twenty six. Oh, at twenty six. Um, yes. Why? Why, why twenty six? I don't know. My sister got married at twenty six, so I just felt okay. Yeah, you know, it'd be nice to get married at twenty six. So I always wanted to get married at twenty six, but then I didn't get married till I was thirty two. So whilst waiting one of the things i was doing was um i'd set up a charity for unprivileged children and i would go into slum communities to like feed those children take them to church and somehow be responsible for their welfare so um fast forward 2015 when i was 32 okay i've given out my age already i got married and um as soon as I got married, one of the things that I really wanted to do was have children. I wasn't young anymore, so I just thought it would be nice to just jump in and then, you know, start to have children. And, of course, I had some other things that I thought about. One, would I be a good wife? Two, would I, would I be submissive? Would I be a good mother? <laughs> All those sort of things. But nothing prepared me for the experience I was going to go through. Okay. when it came to childbirth so you into marriage you wanted to have children straight away because obviously you oh yeah you had planned yes and then what happened yeah so um i didn't get pregnant immediately like on my wedding night and of course i i wasn't worried because again, I didn't think there was going to be any problem. So I wasn't worried. But by the time my marriage was about six months, seven months, people started calling to ask, oh, how are you? What's happening? Oh, this, oh, that. And I'm like, can you just wait? Anyways, I got pregnant um, in December 2016. I found out I was pregnant in December 2016. I was happy. But I noticed I was always having discharge and all of that so i read up for some people it was normal <clears throat> and there was really no problem and i carried on so when i was 23 weeks that was five months into my pregnancy there was this day it was a sunday from nowhere i just started feeling this you know this menstrual cramps it was really really it, it became it, it started mild but it became very worse as time went on and I had to tell my husband that I'm not finding this funny anymore. <laughs> it's really, really painful. And we were like, okay, let's go to A&E. So we went to A&E. It was about 8 p.m. that night. And at some point, I couldn't even sit anymore. Oh, wow. So I started pacing because we waited for five hours. 
before yeah before I was called in and by the time I was called in I was checked and I was 4 cm dilated wow yes and you know it, what it was my first pregnancy I still didn't get it and they had to put me on admission immediately that you can't go home you have to be on bed rest this that this that before I knew it they didn't let me walk they put me on like a, a bed and I saw doctors coming in saying, oh, um, your pregnancy ideally would be viable when you're 25 to 26 weeks. Can you just hang in there till you're like eight, 28 weeks to 30 weeks? And in my mind, I'm like, what are these things? You know, I'll stay till 38 weeks. You know, I, I didn't understand it. Yeah. So then my husband had to go home. The next morning, okay, I couldn't sleep through the night. I was, the, the pain was getting intense. Well, they don't give you anything for the pain. So they were giving me painkillers, I think. But it was just, get, no, they didn't give me anything, actually. Because they wanted to know how often the pains were coming. And how so I too didn't pain. know it was labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was so bad. And, you know, I would call, they didn't let me go to use the toilet or anything everything i had to do in bed it would bring everything i needed and i was like okay this is pampering but it's pampering with pain and the next morning my husband came and i heard the midwife say to him she's about to have the baby you have to hold her and you know at that point you know I, my nigerian just came out like which baby <laughs> i just started to cry I was weak. You know, they gave me gas and air. I think that's what it's called. I couldn't hold it. Wow. You, I couldn't hold it. My husband held it. It was like, just, you know, use it. I was like, I can't even do it. The lady said, push. I'm like, I can't push. I'm just tired. It's painful. She was like, no, the baby is small. Um, it won't be so painful. Just push. And my first push, the baby came out. And when the baby came out, you know, everybody was, my husband cried. In fact, that was the first time I was, I saw my husband cry and he was alive. And they cleaned him up, you know, wrapped him up and put him in the, they, put, they, they asked if I wanted to carry him. I carried him, you know, and, you know, they put him by my side and he was alive for two hours. So they didn't do anything. They didn't try to they resuscitate. Try no, they didn't try. They didn't even try. There was 24 weeks, 24 weeks there. Yeah, so I was 23 weeks and I think four days, just about to get into 24 weeks. So painful. So they didn't, they didn't do anything at all. And, you know, I would go there, look at him, speak to him, because we... We had already bonded with him. We had given him a name. And, you know, I would talk to him. Oh, can you hear me? You should have stayed. What happened? It was really, really, you know. So I was discharged. I think the next day I was home. So I was home without my baby. And I was home without my pregnancy. Wow. So it, it, it was... It was... It was different. I felt I'd lost something. Of course, yeah, you had. Yeah, so it was, it was, I cried sometimes, but I just felt, you know what, God can't do it. You know, God had the power to stop it, but he didn't stop it. You know, you it's had to, you. you had to bury him then, didn't you? Because obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they gave us a memory box. They gave us a memory box took pictures of his hands and his feet, all those sort of things. I still have the memory box somewhere in the house. And for, I, I opened it for the first time this year. Wow. Okay. Maybe we'll speak about that later as a why you decided to do that. Yeah, but anyway, continue. I don't want to So um, they had said I, they were suspecting that I had incompetent cervix mm -hmm. and all of that. So the bereavement... Um, nurse had to come to us you know we had to arrange um, a burial all of that and was buried so 2016 this is one year into your marriage 18 months into your marriage um yeah so yeah 
I found out I was pregnant in 2016, December. This happened in April 2017. So I lost the pregnancy in April 2017. Even in terms of your marriage, how was that on the marriage? Well, no, it didn't. I think we just felt, okay, you know what? It has happened. It's sad, but we will not stay there. Just and I remember that the midwife that was assigned to me then after I lost the pregnancy, I think it was my six weeks. No, it wasn't my six weeks appointment. It was earlier. She had said to me that, oh, you know what? It's time to most people mourn and do all that. That's fine too. If you need to cry, cry, you know, whatever you need to do to, but this is your most fertile window. Make good use of it. Wow. Well, that was kind of fun. Oh, yeah, that was what she said. And I was like, oh, really? Okay, we will make good use of it. I told my husband, this side is my most fertile window. Let's make good use of it. And surprisingly, we made very good use of it. I was pregnant again six weeks after. Wow. Look at that. I was pregnant six weeks after. So six weeks after, we were happy. And there was a plan that they probably would put in a stitch when I was 12 or 14 weeks because, but they were not sure if he was in competent cervix at that time. Yeah. So I carried on with the pregnancy and, you know, at 12 weeks, they, they felt I was going on fine. So they didn't need to put in the stitch. So okay. maybe it wasn't in, in competent cervix anyway. So I carried on. And when I was 18 weeks, that was four months, second trimester again, started feeling very unwell and we landed in a and e again and that was in it was october yeah 18 weeks and it was in october I remember i lost the first in april october i landed in a and e again and um by the time i was checked it was another five hours wait by the time i was checked um i was fully dilated wow so they should have yeah. put that stitch would have moved. So they had to put in an emergency stitch. Okay. So they immediately wheeled me into the theater, did the emergency, emergency stitch, and, um, you know, we were hopeful that we were going to save that pregnancy. And immediately they wheeled me into the room. I just started throwing up. My temperature went and I was very unwell I was shivering it was really bad like the midwife was scared for me and you know they had to before they put in the stitch they had checked the baby the baby was fine the baby was not distressed so that was why they decided to put in the stitch but by the time they checked the baby after putting the stitch and I became unwell the baby had died oh so, at that point, I had sepsis. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and from what I know and I hear about it, it's very, it's very, very, you can lead to death, like, very quickly. So, they had to wheel me back into the theater to take out the stage. So, at that point, after they wheeled me, back out after they are taking out the stitch the midwife was going to get me induced to go into labor because i had then yeah i still had to birth the child so at that point as she was getting to the door i was like no come back the baby is out really oh yeah yeah wow. yeah i i think the the anger just you know, made it like, okay, come, come and do what you need to do. Don't induce me again. I'm tired. Yeah, Just yeah, the yeah. baby is out. You know, she came and I remember, I think she was a student midwife or something. And she said to me, would you like to see the baby? I was like, no, I don't want to see her. And, you know, I didn't see her. And, you know, that that was really, really... So I'd had a boy the first time, had a girl had a the second girl. time. Yeah. And 
yeah, that was it. And they asked if I wanted a memory box. I was like, that's not what I want to keep in my life. I don't want memory box, please. You people just leave me with your bereavement protocol. Go. And they came and said, oh, so um, we have to do a funeral. Would you like us to bury her beside a brother? And I was like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. So, of course, we have, we had named the boy. We hadn't named her yet. So we had a baby show don't care just by her brother. And that was it. <sighs> Again, it was, it wasn't a good, and okay. So where I worked then, I worked in Jesus' house then. And we had different people getting pregnant at different times. So I was pregnant at the, at the same time as some people. And I would have babies. Yeah, they went on to have their babies. Yeah. I would go and come back with a flat tummy and without a baby. Yeah. And many times I sensed this, oh, just be careful around to Lulope, you know, don't say, okay, I was here one day, it was, people were calling me here one day then, you know, just be careful, don't say this. Even when we went to visit people that had babies you know they behave a certain way around me and i'm like why do you think that was because they didn't want to hurt you yeah or do you think yeah that was it but you that was you so bad about that did you not like that i did I didn't like it. There was one that was really obvious. We had gone for, um, we had gone to visit someone who had a baby and, you know, it was time to pray. And maybe normally they would have asked me to pray. But I think the person had even mentioned me and was, oh, I'll take the prayers. You know? Yeah. So it was, it wasn't from a bad place. It was yeah. just from a place of, ah, this is sensitive, you know. Don't let go there. We, we don't know what to... So, okay, so let me ask you this question. And I know it's different for each person. But sometimes I think as the people that are not involved in it, we don't know how to respond. I mean, I, I always say, just ask the person, is it okay to, you know what I mean? Can I talk about this? Or can, because I, fi I find that sometimes we end up hurting the person because we're trying to protect them or trying to... Yeah. So what would you have preferred? in that situation what do you think is i mean i don't i know that it's different for every person so somebody else might say you know yeah. talk to me. but how would you have rather been treated in that situation with Just because I'm assuming that these people are your friends effectively yeah 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 just treat me like you would normally because it then puts me in this place that i don't want to be yeah you get yeah. just be normal let's pray oh to look my pray and so I would not, pray. Do not exclude you because of it. Treat you how they normally yeah. would have. I mean, I, I personally probably would have asked you, just, Tolu, are you okay to pray type of thing? As Oh, yeah. Saying. Even if you asked me that, I would have preferred it than, okay, you know, people are now looking at, hey, why did he say that? Oh, you know, it just puts yeah. you in this place that you don't want to be. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was pregnant around the same time. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm. So they take you back. Yeah. So where so you really? really the yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Yes. So you you had the first. So you've lost two babies now. What mm -hmm. happened next? Okay. So, so I went home. Now, now in 2018. We are still in 20. No. 2017. We are yes, still in 2017. Of, yeah, October. October. Yeah. yeah. So I went home. In fact, I remember telling my husband because at that point they were sure it was incompetent cervix, and I said to my husband that come. I'm the one with the problem. Go and look for a wife that has competent cervix. So it doesn't look like oh, me. Because it was as if my body was rejecting the babies. Yeah. And it, it wasn't a good it wasn't a good feeling. You know, and you know, I'd received the word from God the first time it happened that you will carry and you will retain. And I held on to that word. But I still carried and lost the second time. But the thing, what I found is... Not the second time, did you think that this word was not going to happen? Did you give up on the word? No, I didn't give up on the word. I knew it was going to happen. When? I didn't know when. Yeah. But I knew it was going to happen. Okay. So, the, so by... That was October. So, March, the following year, yeah. it was my birthday. And you know how it is in JH that you don't go to work on your birthday. You know, people are saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. And that was my worst birthday ever. Yeah. 
because I was at home. Oh, of course. And I really thought about my life. I'm like, God, how many children have I helped in this life? Why should I be the one going through this sort of thing? Like, even children I don't know from anywhere. Should I be the one carrying this cross? But little did I know that you are really tested in the place of your assignment. You see, so it's interesting now that it's almost like you felt you had an insurance policy because you had given because you had given so much to children who had nobody. Then why didn't yeah. you get to have your own children? Like it's it, yeah. it it made I mean it it follows that you've given, you've sown somewhere. So why are you not receiving mm -hmm. what you want to receive? Yeah. But like you said, that's not how God works. Sometimes it's not like that. Okay, go on. And you know the funny thing? People said it. People would call me and say, ah, no, not you. I know how long you've been, you know, taking care of children. So even when you don't have things like that in your head, people, people give, you know, yeah, people put it like, ah, no, 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 don't worry. You've helped so many children. God is going to do this and all of that. So anyways, March, I didn't know I was pregnant on my birthday. Long story short, I was actually pregnant again the third time See, so i was quite fertile i mean you know yeah. pregnant, not your problem. <laughs> someone tells me that she used to tell me that you yeah someone that you someone if you're touched like this you just get pregnant <laughs> yes. okay so you were pregnant that's my so i was pregnant yeah yeah and immediately i called my consultant that i was pregnant she was dancing she was really happy and she was like this time we're not going to Okay, and by that time, I'd been referred to, I think, St. Mary's. Okay, yeah. Because it's a specialist hospital for... Yeah. Yeah. So I started having scans from when I was six weeks. It started really early, so the plan was for them to put in a stitch at yeah. 12 or 14 weeks. So when I was 12 weeks, my consultant was like, oh, I'll put in the stitch. You know, you don't have to go back to St. Mary's. And you know my consultant. <laughs> so um, at 14 weeks, the stitch was put in. By the time she was putting in the stitch, I was already dilating. Wow. Yeah. And she was like, oh, it's a good thing we put in this in early. And I was put on bed rest, like complete bed rest. I wasn't allowed to do anything. All I did was use the bathroom before my husband went to work he would make, make sure everything i needed was out food i'll just use the microwave so i was just there like just there doing nothing no work nothing at 18 weeks from nowhere this breeze blew again and gosh it was it was i just went to my husband i said no that is pain is it was like, are you sure you really want to go to the hospital? I said, yes. I don't feel well. And we went there immediately. So I'd become a customer. <laughs> At the hospital, they knew you. Yeah. So immediately they saw me, they admitted me. And they now said, oh, okay, let's take her to. So they were wheeling me to a particular room. Immediately, I saw where they were taking me to. I started crying. Okay, and why? They were asking, why? Why is she crying? So my husband looked up and he was like, oh, she won't want to be there because that was the room where I had the first two. Oh, well, so, the same room you had the first two? Yeah. Oh, wow. And I was like, I don't want to go to that room. So it felt like that room was the yeah, thing. The <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want to go to that room. Take me elsewhere. No, I'm not losing this baby. Don't take me to that room. You know, my husband was like, can you please take her somewhere else? And so they arranged to take me to Gyne Ward. So I was in Gyne Ward. And it was a Friday I got in. Saturday, you know, I was fine. I was stable. By Sunday, I was physically shaking like it was my husband was scared wow and it was almost you know he's a doctor as a well doctor. Yeah. yeah and it was almost 
like shouting at the doctors. I treat her for infections. She's exhibiting signs of infections. You don't need to do this. Just treat her for, and you know, I was exhibiting signs of infection, but they had done blood tests. They couldn't find it. Okay. So, I think, I can't remember what they gave me. I was fine. But that night, I was very, very mm -hmm. unsettled. So, my husband went home. The next morning, I was unwell. It was so, I was turning white. And yeah, a healthcare assistant had come to me to say, oh, you need to eat something. I said, no, I don't want to eat. And, you know, she was as if she forced me to eat, to drink tea. And I eventually took the tea. Maybe like 10 minutes after I took the tea, my consultant just came in. Immediately she came in and she saw me. She just started crying. I just saw tears. And she said, I have to take this baby out. If I don't take this baby out, I risk losing you. So it's better I take out this baby, save your life so you can get pregnant again, than try to save the baby. Because my temperature was over the bar. She said, because the way you're going, you might have a cardiac arrest. Your body is trying to fight whatever this is. And your body's tired. So, she said, prepare for theater. Well, you'd eaten. I'm taking tea. Hey! I was like, this nurse from hell. <laughs> I said, I want tea. <laughs> you gave me tea. Oh, you know? Goodness. The way my consultant behaved that day. That was the day I knew she was God sent to me from the first pregnancy. But that day I knew she was an angel. She was angry. <laughs> the old word, nobody sat down. She just started shouting, who gave her tea? Did you not see her? Why did you give her something? Did you not think she would go to the theater? She was really upset. Anyway, I had to wait for maybe three hours for the thing to go before they took me to the theater. So they wheeled me to the theater, took out the stitch. She couldn't do it. Because she was she was emotionally invested already. In the, yeah, so she couldn't do it. And she said to her, I can't do this thing. As in, of course, I don't think it's professional that I feel this way. But it's like a journey we've been walking through together. Yeah, and I thought we were going to actually have this baby. So she couldn't do it herself at that point. So I was wheeled into the theater and... They took out the stitch and they took me back to the room. And the doctor was like, oh, I need to go prepare to induce you to go into labor. I can't believe and they get... labor for all of these children. Yeah, I did. I did. So I was like, okay. Before I got to the door, I was like, the baby is out. <laughs> you are not having it. Oh my gosh. The guy was like, what? As in, <laughs> he was surprised. He was like, what? I said, the baby is out. And of course, the baby came out. He was alive. He said, I'm coming. I think the shock so for him. Baby? 18 weeks as well. Weeks. So he, he walked out of the room. Mm -hmm. And I think the guy ran away. Because <laughs> he, he wasn't, he didn't know, like how how did that happen <laughs> so we had waited 20 minutes he wasn't back 30 minutes he wasn't back my husband was getting worried i had not delivered the placenta oh wow and okay i forgot to mention the first one i had i had to go back into the hospital when we had the first one because every time i think for the first two days every time i did a wee there was this foul smell and my husband would be like, this is not normal. There's something wrong. So we went back. By the time we went back, they didn't take out all the tissues. They had, yeah. And thankfully, they, we went back immediately because that, that would have been very... Yeah. 
yeah so i had this baby eventually they came the placenta came out and that was the breaking point for me it was you know when people say oh a heart was broken before i used to think it was just an english word or a phrase it's actually a thing your heart breaks you know, at that point, my heart was, I could feel it. Mm. Like I, I was, when we got home, I was just crying. I was saying to my husband, my heart is broken. Why is God doing this to me? Why is God testing me? I can't take it anymore. And, you know, I was just, my heart was, as in, it was real. That heartbreak was real to me. And what also made it real to me was that time. We then had to pay to bury the baby. The okay, first two, I don't know. They just said there was something, 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 and we had to pay. And I'm like, ah, I, I don't care what this is. Or whatever it is, it's not playing with us. We cannot play. I can't be paying to bury children. And they came back and said, oh, would you like him to be buried beside his siblings? And I was like, yes, bury him there. Let them all be together. It's fine. And it was really tough for me. It was, it was, I don't think my husband had ever seen me like that. You know, I would just look at me. I mean, it must have been a bit tough on him too. Oh. You know, sometimes we always think that it's the, the woman that bears the brunt. And I'm sure we do, because obviously we have birthed the child, etc. But sometimes I think we forget the husband. So how was he? I think that was one of the things that made me get on quickly my husband doesn't talk a lot so he internalizes things more and i felt if you stay here and you're always sad he most likely won't talk and then you break your relationship yeah you know i'm the one who is oh hey, hey, hey. i'm always very everywhere it's not like that it's more reserved so i had to you know consciously Okay, let's do this together. Yeah. You know, because, yeah, I was the one carrying the baby and experiencing all that. But then he was the father of the ch children as well. And he went through the journey with you. I mean, not in the same detail as you went yeah. through it, but he went through the journey with you as well. So I think it's, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think now my I'm so fresh. My body is all, you know, looking good. Everywhere I had bruises from needles from plasters, from as in, I would look at my hands and start crying. Plasters everywhere, everywhere. So that happened, the third one. And that was it, as in, I was, but the funny thing is this, I wasn't happy. But somehow, people that knew me and didn't know what I was going through couldn't tell I was going through stuff. Yeah. Because when my testimony was read in church, someone came to me and said, ah, well, I used to see you now. How? How can that be you? You know? So that went and um, we had to go back to the drawing board. And my consultant was like, okay, we need to take out these fibroids. We don't know what... <laughs> yeah, I had fibroids. So we don't know what the trigger was and you need to take out these fibroids. Let's just do that. And see what happens. So October of that year. So I lost the baby in July. Yeah. October of that year, I had to do myomectomy. So they took out the fibroids. And I think that was also very painful. Even more than the labor pains. Because that was the first time I was being caught. Yeah. Okay, so physically painful. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, after the surgery, she had said to me that, oh, yeah, so now that we've taken it out. And then they had to put in another stitch. So the plan was to put in a stitch before I got pregnant. Okay. And um, she said two things she was worried about. One was the fibroids could come back. Two was um, I could have adhesions, so scarring tissues, so it could prevent me from getting pregnant easily and all of that. But yeah, that, that was it. I shouldn't start trying to get pregnant until six months after. But you didn't listen, did you? 
No, no. <laughs> and six months after was would have been March. Okay. Yeah, so we were like, oh, that's fine. Six months. I needed time to recover. They just cut me open and all. So, hmm, December, I now started feeling funny. I now said to my husband, I'm feeling pregnant. I said, what did we do? You can't be feeling pregnant. You are still recovering from this surgery you just did and all of that. Anyway, I ordered pregnancy test strips from Amazon. I'm sure I did like four. One second. Don't look away. We've got a question here. Um, Design Coco, the stitches, basically, they thought she had an incompetent cervix. And so what they tend to do with that, I'm not a medical person, but they stitch up the cervix in advance so that it doesn't open, so she doesn't dilate before it's time for her to dilate. So that's it's yeah. almost like a preventative measure that they put in stitches to hold her cervix together before mm -hmm. so that it doesn't open too early. Okay, sorry, continue to look now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and you know, I'd asked um, one of the doctors that, okay, what causes incompetent cervix? Mm -hmm. And said, oh, most people that have it probably did abortions. I've never done abortion before. I don't know. Well, you know, so know. it's not, yeah, that was what I was told. But I was like, I don't know. That's not my own case. But, well, that was where I found myself. So, um, December, I did the pregnancy test and two lines stared at me. And for the first time, I found out I was pregnant and I was crying. Wow. I was sad. Scared. I was scared. The fear was, it was on my chest. Aha, you this girl, you want to kill yourself. How did it even happen? How did you get pregnant? You know, when I told my husband, it was calm down first. I said, we need to call the consultant. He was like, no, 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 don't call her yet. She would say, how? Because I should know. I should know. As a doctor, what? you should know. <laughs> I should know. Don't call her. Don't call her. So we didn't call her on the night we found out. The next day, I was like, I need to. So when I found out I was afraid, I had to speak to that fear. Because I knew that it was a journey I had to go on. And I couldn't afford to go afraid. Yes. So I was like, God, you have not given me the spirit of fear. And you have given me this blessing once again. Yeah. And you have also promised that I will carry and I will retain. Mm -hmm. So I want to walk this journey in confidence that you're my father. And that was it. I spoke to the fear and it went away. So... I called the consultant. She missed my call. She called me back. She was like, what's up? I said, I don't know how to say this, but I'm pregnant. Immediately she heard, she just started dropping. She said, I had backache before it has disappeared. I said, oh, you're not upset. You're not worried. She said, what? Shut up. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. There's nothing that will happen to this one. You will carry to term, you know. And she just encouraged me. And that was it. And we went on the journey. So for the first time in my pregnancy journeys, I carried this pregnancy for nine months without any money in sickness. And you know how God works. All my pregnancy, I my pregnancies, I never had money in sickness. Not one. Maybe that was compensation for what I was going through. <laughs> you know, and I would drive 40 miles to work every day and 40 miles back. I drove myself to work. And yeah, 2019, August, I had my daughter. And it was just God. It was just God. And, you know, my um, consultant had said something when... We had to, she brought out a physical calendar and we were trying to calculate, were you pregnant when we did the surgery to take out the fibroids? Because I don't understand. No, you were not pregnant. So when did you get pregnant? How did you get pregnant? I said, I don't think we did anything. We said, oh. <laughs> you know, but I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she said to me that when God is, when God does his work, that he even puts 
them to shame as doctors. And that was what God did for me. Fantastic. And today I have two beautiful children, full-term babies. Yes, and you've got a boy, a girl and a boy. Yeah. So you yeah. Can... Mirani can't stop it. Mirani said he sneezed and you caught it. I caught it. <laughs> From his yes, sneeze. So, okay, so I want to just unpack a few things here. Because, okay. you know, you gave us great detail on when you were losing the babies. So after you had got rid of the fear and you went into this pregnancy with, you know, confidence that God was going to do it. I mean, I saw you during this pregnancy and absolutely there was no, you know, you were... I was going to say you are normal. You are normal. <laughs> there was nothing that, you know, that made it. Um, but I know you had dealt with the fear. Every single day. Was there, were you praying something? Were you, how did, because you see, I feel like, and I haven't, I, I, I can't even speak from, I've not experienced this before. So I don't mm. know what it is to lose a child. I can only imagine. I mean, I can't imagine, but I can imagine what it would be to lose. I knew they always say the further along you go, the worse it is. You know, if you lose it at two weeks, it's painful, but you know, you lose it at four weeks, eight. So the further along you go, the more painful it becomes. Now you mm -hmm. lost two at 18 weeks, one at 23 weeks, right? Yeah. When you hit 18 weeks with the, with your daughter that you have now, did anything happen? Did, did you, or was, were you completely free of fear? Was it, how was that particular journey? So yeah, definitely. When I hit 18 weeks for my daughter, I was, so what we started doing when we found out I was pregnant, myself and my husband, was we started praying every day for the pregnancy. Like every day we would pray. And when I was getting to 18 weeks, I made sure our prayer points changed and we were speaking to fear. Okay. That's because I knew, because we had a conversation and I said to him, I'm going to be 18 weeks next week. And, you know, because two happened at 18 weeks, it was kind of, it was kind of space for fear. Of course, of course, understandably. So, yeah, so, you know, our prayer points changed. I was like, spirit of fear, spirit of, I was speaking the word against fear, you know. And I, I said to him that if I enter 19 weeks, nothing will happen to this child. As in, but that week of 18, 18 yeah. I'm sure I did beat you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, okay, God, I receive the spirit of boldness. I receive the spirit of confidence. I receive your love. I receive life. I receive your light. You know, I was just speaking those things and, you know, praying those things. And when I drove to work, you know, it's a long drive from my house to work. And I used to, it's funny, it's not a Christian song, but I used to play Adekunle Gold. Um, it's funny. <laughs> and it's, I would dance all the way. In fact, I played different songs. So there was Adekunle Gold where I would say, it's Yoruba, like, okay. It says that um, I'm higher than the world. You can't catch me. You are not my God. As in, let me live my life. You know, so there was this day I was driving to work and I was saying, and you know, one big store just eats my windscreen from nowhere. And I'm like, oh, you people have lost the bottle. I don't care where <laughs> that came from. But this child, I will carry and carry to term. Because I'm going to carry and retain. I will not give up my seed anymore. My body will not reject my children anymore. Because it, it was tough, but thank God we are where we are. You are where you are. Thank God. I mean, thank God. Because it's, I, I think it's a, it's a tough journey. Now, okay, I'm going to ask you. During the time when you were pregnant and losing the children, mm -hmm. how, because, you know, we come from an African society. There are huge expectations on the woman when she gets married that she should produce heirs. Yeah. And a lot of the time, certainly in our society, even if the man is the one with the problem, it is always the woman that is going to get the blame because she didn't bring the children. You know how it is. So mm -hmm. how was it in your family setting? Were, were you okay in terms of 
how you were treated? What was it? Be okay? Before before I got pregnant. Before, before you had a child to tell. When you were getting pregnant and losing children. Oh, okay. They were quite understanding. So from my family and even my husband's family, it was more of support. Like, yeah. oh, don't worry. You know, as soon as they heard, they would just call, oh, don't worry. God will do this. God will do that. You know, you don't need to feel pressured. Just yeah. take your time. Yeah, yeah but yeah. And another thing that I didn't say. So the first three, every time we got pregnant, we would tell family at 12 weeks that we were pregnant you know just tell our parents and all of that but by the time the third one happened we made a decision not to tell anybody about the pregnancy so if you saw me when i was pregnant yes you would know yeah but you didn't announce it so i didn't tell my mom my mom didn't know i was pregnant with keton didn't know i was pregnant with my son as well you know so when i had my daughter I just sent a picture to my sister or my to my siblings and said, "Oh, your niece is here." You know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So anybody that saw me knew I was pregnant, but people that didn't see me didn't know I was pregnant because at that time I just knew it wasn't. It wasn't because I felt they had anything to do with anything. You know how we think as Nigerians, so maybe this person is the one doing me. That wasn't it. But I just felt it was a journey we had to go through with God. Yeah, yeah. Because those people really couldn't do anything. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Design Coco has just put up something. It's just occurred to me that you made babies that are angels singing and dancing in heaven. Thank you. Oh, thank lovely. you <laughs> that's lovely um yeah okay so guys if you have any questions please put them in the question box and i'll um ask to look i have lots of questions but if you have any questions <laughs> do put them in there okay so you've um what's the age difference between kito and her brother um 18 months 18 months so you know how you gave us great detail of each of the first three pregnancies We've had ketones thing. When you now got pregnant with her brother, was it a surprise? Was it planned? Was it, how did it? I was actually looking forward to getting pregnant again. Oh, fantastic. After keto, I wanted to, I didn't want the gap yeah, the between them to be, yeah. So um, when I had keto, I was like, you know how people go and do um, these contraceptives. I got it from the GP. I never used it. <laughs> i never used it i was i i wanted to get pregnant okay you know i even thought i was going to get pregnant six months after but god, god. god was kind <laughs> gave you time to adjust to mother. <laughs> you know my husband even said you know after the third one it was like your body needs to rest i think we need to stop getting pregnant like you were pregnant the whole of 2017, 2018. Yeah. Can we just, you know, slow down? You know, but yeah, I was really looking forward to get pregnant with my son. So it, you see, it's, it's, and that pregnancy was perfect as well. There were no issues. Full time. It, there, no, no issues. So my consultant had moved to Nigeria at the point when I was pregnant with my son. And oh, that also made me kind of worry because you had quite because, a good relationship with her, so you knew that she a knew good that relationship. Was. She had my history, she was with me from my first pregnancy, and she was also a Christian. I think that's also a amazing. Christian, like it was so. She, she is that woman cannot do wrong in my eyes. I say to people. Yeah, she's my big sister. I love her too. Uh, she can't do from no. I can just sit down and I'm like, huh. I send her a message. You know what? God, whatever you are doing, God will continue to bless you because she was indeed God sent to me. You know that period. So when I was pregnant, I called. Her. I said, I'm pregnant, but you are not here. <laughs> what am I gonna do? She was like, Don't worry. And you know, it was it, God is so good that he. You know, it says the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. So everything she needed to do to prepare me for my son's pregnancy, she had done before she left. 
So the doctors were saying, wherever your consultant was, made our work easy. Lovely. I hope you told her that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they wanted me to have my son earlier because okay. of, yeah, because of maybe space or whatever it was, hospital. Oh, so nothing to do with you. This was about them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And because of my history, they were kind of worried as yeah. well. And, you know, they didn't know me from anywhere. And they, they were like, oh, you know what? We need to. I now called my consultant. They are saying they want to get the baby out. She said, no. Tell them no. No. <laughs> the way she said it, she said, do you want me to call them? Tell them no. You're going to carry this baby till that, you know. And it's funny that every day added or removed actually is very important in a child's development. Yes, absolutely. So she was like, no. You know, you will tell them what you want to your child. You know, so I would now get to the hospital with this attitude or I've spoken to my <laughs> like I'm like, no, 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 you can't. No, no, I don't want to have that baby the baby on this day. Yeah, so you have to move it by in fact I said I don't I don't feel cared for, you know. <laughs> but it was just the confidence that yeah, my consultant yeah. had given me, like, no, don't let anybody do that to you. It's not time. You will wait for time. You will have that baby. Nothing is going to happen to you. If they are worried about something, maybe your health or have concerns about yeah, things you're showing, it's fine. But no. So, okay, so with your son at 18 weeks, what happened? I'd have overcome you? that. Yeah, Rikita. So you didn't even do, did you do the daily prayers with his pregnancy as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And did you yeah. change the prayers at 18 weeks or you didn't? No, so, yeah. like, so no, you know, we're expecting a, another sister, aren't we? From who? <laughs> no, you've only got no. Me. Come on, <laughs> the strength I have now is to take care of them. <laughs> <laughs> to take care of them. Okay. Oh, brilliant! Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I think, I mean, I think. Okay, there were a couple of things we wanted to bring out in this story, and you know, we titled it "Not Easily Broken," because when we were thinking about it, we're like, you know somebody who has gone through that. I mean, and I, you know, I think it's very easy for us to not, to, to underestimate what that takes, the toll on the body, the toll on the heart, the toll on the mind, just the whole toll of going through, because pregnancy does a lot to our bodies anyway, to our beings, not just our bodies, mm -hmm. to our whole emotional, everything anyway. So you have that three times and you come out without children at the end of this. I mean, it's, you know, the toll of that is more than enough to break someone. Now, when I was speaking to you yesterday and we're talking about it, we had this, obviously we had um, this thing of, have you, were you broken? And you know, we had the conversation and you were like, mm -hmm. because obviously you said your heart was broken after baby number three, because yeah. at that point you were like, you know, Lord, why is this happening to me? But I don't think you were broken. I don't know what your take is on that because I think that mm -hmm. yes, your heart is broken, but you you never seem to give up on the hope. Maybe from the word that you had, I'm I'm not sure, but you mm -hmm. never seem to give up hope because you kept going back. <laughs> you know, like yeah. the only place where there was maybe a glimmer of doubt was when you were telling your husband to go and find a wife with a good cervix. Like <laughs> that, but you yeah. know, we'll, we'll, we'll ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I mean, so I, I don't know. Am I correct? There was never a point when you. I mean, obviously you went through, you see, I don't want to make it sound, I don't want to make it sound easy, but mm. obviously you went through what was a very hard time, but at, was there any point where you thought, that's it? Did you ever get angry with God? Did you fight God? Was there any point where you just thought, this is not going to happen? And Well, anger, I never got angry with God. Questions, yes, I asked him a lot of questions. Yeah, I asked him a lot of questions and I think because I I knew God was speaking all the time. So there was a night that I prayed. You know, sometimes I'm just, you know, when you say reckless abandon, like I'm like, God, I don't want that. What do you want me to do, Gongo? As in what? You know, and that night I was so, sometimes my husband is sleeping in the middle of the night. You know, I'm just by myself, like as I am, God, what exactly is this about? And a word dropped in my spirit. I can't forget that word. 
and it was Europa. I didn't understand the meaning. You know, I had to like dig deep to now. What was this called? It's called Irapada. That was what I heard in my spirit. And Irapada is restoration. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think those things built my faith. So and even was this word dropping was this after maybe three before baby I think three? I think this this was after I, I can't really say when Rick to be honest but I had words at different times and I think I even had more words before I actually had my children yeah. so imagine when you get the word and it doesn't happen you're like ah, maybe I didn't hear well yes, yes. <laughs> Did you know but then I kept going. And another thing I found is, because I asked God, why this? I don't understand it. What are you trying to teach me? I don't get. Is it patience? Is it what? Yeah. You know? But I then realized that the things you go through, sometimes they're actually not for you. Mm-hmm. They're for yeah. other people. Yeah. Because after I had the first... I found that when I was speaking to people who had miscarriages or were going through tough times, having their children, once I talked to them for five minutes, they're like, I feel at peace, you know? So I think I went through it not for myself, except God is still going to show me, you know, why he made me go through it for myself. But I think it's more to heal others, to to help others handle things when they go through such. So I think that's I, one of the reasons. I completely agree with you. I mean, I think that as Christians, pretty much everything, our talents are not for us, they're for other people. What we go through is not for us, it's for other people. I think it's all about, it's, it's other-centered because that's the whole thing about Christ. It's not about, it's, a, it's selflessness. So the, I personally feel that as Christians, a lot of what we go through, a lot of what we have is not for us. It's for other people. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we lose sight of that. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. So then, ahead. yeah, then there was a time, I don't rem- know if you remember when we had the upper room experience. Yes, I do. So there was a day um, Beatrice sang, I will not be silent. I will always worship you. Yeah. Yep. And I found myself saying, I wasn't saying I will not be silent. What I was saying was I will not be silenced. Hmm. Okay. You know, and I walked yeah. up to her after and I'm like, hmm. What I kept saying was I will not be silenced. This thing wants to silence me, really. Yeah. Because at some point I felt, you know what, I'm not going to do anything for any child again that is underprivileged. You yeah. know? But that was actually, I think, if... I didn't get a grip of God. Mm. It would have silenced me. It would have silenced my calling, which is centered around helping children. Yeah. Okay. That takes me to the next thing, because I wanted you to talk a little bit about your charity, because obviously you've been doing this from way before you even got married, haven't you? Way mm-hmm. before you got married, you've been helping children. So tell us a little bit about your charity and how we can help, what people can do to help, what you do. Just talk to us about your charity. Okay, so my charity is called Green okay, Pasture. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Before you go there, I remember I saw a question. Someone wanted to know at 23 weeks with Ketom, were you scared? Because you know we said at 18 weeks, because you know mm-hmm. 18 and 23 were the trigger points before. So 18 yeah. weeks, you changed your prayer. At 23 weeks, were you scared? No, I wasn't. So you were fine? Okay. Yeah. So, I, I just felt that if I crossed that 18 weeks, you would I was yeah, fine. If you yeah. to 19 weeks, you would be fine. Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Now go back to your charity. What's it called? Okay, so it's called Green Pasture Kiddies. Um, I started it sixteen years ago. Wow. And um, what we do is that we reach out to underprivileged children, mostly in slum communities. So initially, when I started in Nigeria, yeah. So when I started, I used to go to orphanages, but I found that every time we went to an orphanage, there were other people there as well who were trying to give these children stuff so i found that even children that live on the streets and in slums nobody would just walk into the slum and give any child anything you know it's rare but you know they have needs as well so yeah so i go into slum communities to help children in need and their families as well 
and pay school fees, um, cater for their welfare, and basically just attend to their needs. And sometimes you go to the hospitals to also help um, children whose parents can't afford to pay their bills. There was a time we're in partnership with Luth, and um, we found that for people that um, don't know Lagos, Lagos University Teaching Hospital. So, yeah, there are actually children there whose parents can afford to pay their bills. So even when they are discharged from the hospital, from the hospital, they don't allow them leave. So they are there. And sometimes at that time, I don't know about now, some of their parents had to work for the hospital to pay the bills so they could go back home. Yeah, so what I was then doing was trying to raise funds for these children to be properly discharged to go home. Yeah, so really, I just do anything when I see that there is need, especially when it comes to children from such homes. So, is there, so what age group, what is the higher age for the children? Is it up to 17, 18? Or... Yeah, actually, yeah, 0 to 16. So how can we help? Can we help at all? Yes, you can help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One, you can decide to, there's something called not sure one that I do. So you can decide to like adopt a child, okay. foster a child virtually where you... Oh, wait, uh, can you give us your website address? Dele, I saw you were there. Please, Dele, can you type it up in the comments and then I'll ping it. I'll pin it. So, web, do you have the, a website? The web, no, no. The website is still under construction. Okay, well, Instagram, page Instagram is at gpkiddies. GP. P for green and P for pastures. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. And JP kiddies. Okay, continue. Yes, yeah, so um, you can help by nurturing a child. So we, um, you donate uh, a monthly contribution of 20,000 naira that goes to the child's school fees and welfare. Okay, so can we just, I know there are people in Nigeria watching, but for the people that are not in Nigeria, how would we do that? Is that? Do you have a pound equivalent? Or... Okay, so you can either um, support through Just Giving. There's a Just Giving link that I can share later where you can make donations. And for Christmas, we all know that Thank you, things are not particularly easy at this time for people. So we're, we're going to, we're planning to do something called Love in a Box where we would um, feed families, well, get families food for the festive period for christmas so they can feed their families and at least have a good time as well so if you'd like to be a part of that i can also share like a donation link okay so what what i've Dele has put up gp kiddies for us if people go to gp kiddies on instagram can they get all the information i want to be sure that we've yeah. got everything that people yeah. need yeah so and if, if you don't get the information you need you can send the dm and it will be picked up. This is um, this is Tony Lockway, and you can see her handle is Wendy Toy, something like that. Wendy yeah, Toy, Wendy, Toy. Wendy Toy. So you can follow um, uh, if if GP. So follow GP Kitties and Wendy Toy. Okay, so I think that's it, Tony Lockway. Thank you so much. You have thank been you so for having me. You have been amazing. Your strength has come through. In, I mean, I like you said, I was part of your story in the sense that I was there for the latter bit of it. And, you know, God was kind to you. You, you didn't show, you know, people didn't know. I mean, Pastor Ago always says it. If we look like what we're going through, thank God we don't look like what we're going through. Because mm. you certainly didn't look like what you were going through. And you, 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 you were a good testament to the fact that, you know, God still answers prayers. God is faithful. God is still in the business of doing miracles. When people yeah. say it can happen, it can still happen. And you know, you were your living testimony to that. And you have two fantastic little ones to show that. So um, brilliant. But thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you for having me. And, um, yes, God bless you guys. Um, and yes, please, uh, Hangout Cafe community, we know that you guys are the best ones out there. Please follow, support GP Kitties because... Um, She's doing a good thing. And, you know, it's so funny because she said that thing of after all she had put in and then she was going through this. You know, sometimes what we are called to do, it's a, you said it very clearly to me that it's a calling. It wasn't a thing that it was just a call. You felt, in fact, please, before we go, can you tell them why you started GP Kiddies? 
Okay, okay. so yeah, so um, I I've always loved children, but I love children that look good. You know, the ones with cheeks like mine, and they smell very nice. But then I found that I was always having dreams about children, and these children were not the type that I loved to carry. You know, so um, they would disturb me for this, for that in the dreams. And it wasn't one, it wasn't two. two. I had several. So there was this particular dream I had. And in the dream, um, I was in a bus. So I would call it a luxurious bus. Not a luxurious bus. In Nigeria, it's called a Molue bus. <laughs> you know, so not fancy. So I was the conductress on the bus. And all the passengers were children. And all the children were just pulling, and they were not my regular type of Sorry. children that I loved to carry. And they were all disturbing me. Auntie change, auntie milk, auntie this. It was really crazy. And I had to try to attend to their needs. And I woke up. When I woke up, my brother interprets dreams. And I told him, Oh, I had this dream. He was like, Were you the only adult? I said, Actually, no. There was another guy on the bus who was the one driving the bus. But I remember that his name was Femi. Okay. So my brother was like, okay, what does Femi, what's the interpretation of Femi? It means love me. Who were your passengers? Children. And, you know, that was actually the point where I started. So I started Vow for Kids. Valentine's period is love. So that was really what started it. But I believe it was, um, I believe it's a calling from God, it's an assignment for me more than, oh yeah, I want to be out there to be seen as doing good. I think it's just my purpose. That's why I exist. Well, that's part of why I exist. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That is very inspiring. I thought it was important that you said that because, you know, I think even though you had mentioned it before, sometimes we might think that, you know, it's because you wanted a child that you did this or it's because you, you know what I mean? Like it was almost like your bargaining tool. To yeah. Yeah which it wasn't it had started long before you went through all this and everything but yes mm -hmm. thank you very much so guys please don't forget at gp kiddies and at wendy toy please follow her and support gp kiddies because what she's doing is an amazing work with children in nigeria and you can be a part of that too god bless you thank you so much for joining thank us today.